All right, guys, we're going to be starting the class in a few minutes. What we'll do is we'll, uh, while we're waiting for a few more stragglers to come in, we can open it up for questions. And uh, if anybody else comes stepping in, they can just grab a book out of the bag. I got your cards because I'm going to be sending some additional information from the National Fire Escape Association. This class is getting recorded, so uh, everything you say will be held against your future knowledge. Uh, and we put these classes up online. At the end of this, I'll show you some classes, because usually at the end of one of these classes, I, I do what's called a downtown walk around. And I'll either take fire prevention or building inspectors, and we just go downtown. And we look around in the alleyways, we look up at the fire escape. But because we won't have time today, and if my internet connection is good here, we're actually going to just show you some of the some of the classes that uh, that we've been recording. These are three to five minute little videos. And it's just guys like you and gals like you that are out there. And uh, we just basically look up and we uh, we train on, on what needs to be done. So in this first part, let's just talk and open it up. What are some of the concerns? Uh, believe it or not, some of you might even have stories that you've heard about or you witnessed where somebody got hurt on a fire escape, either broke their feet, broke their legs, broke their arms, fell through it. Uh, does anybody have any stories or anything that they uh, before I start clicking along on this, anything to share of just really, Farscape related? It's not really horrific, but it could have been. I wrote this one lady up for her fire escape, and of course she had all kinds of, oh, you know, it's expensive and all of this, but she had it done. And it was a lucky thing she did because she found out that it wasn't as secure to the building that she figured because it was a, like a three, three or four family house. And over the years, because nobody's ever bothered to do it, that's what happened, but she had it fixed, so now she thanked me. Well, that's uh, one story, but we actually have some photographs of people that did fall on fire escapes we'll share with you today, yeah. so um, it's not, could it happen, it, it is happening, and we're going to show it to you at some of those photographs. Any other stories or any other concerns, because that's the two major issues, the fire escape outside and all its connections, and the unknown, how is it tying back into the building, and is it rotted, is it good? We're going to talk today about load tests. We're going to talk today about refurbishment and certification in lieu of a load test. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things we're going to be pushing today is, just so you guys know, we're not pushing load tests. So it's not, this is not a class that's just start load testing every fire escape. There's alternatives to load tests, which are very beneficial to everybody, including the clients. Uh, but in some rare, rare cases, there's going to be pristine fire escapes out there that the only thing you can do with that 25, 50, or 75-year-old fire escape is actually load test it. So we'll talk about that, but this is going to be a rare case. But any other stories? Anybody have any other concerns, uh, whether it be code related, whether it be anything? Anybody have any other issues that they, even if it's I don't know what to do with fire escapes? I mean, anybody have any other concerns with fire escapes? I'll tell you whether or not we're going to cover it today. The problem is the wells and the L stock on the bottom. We find a lot of the wells. The welds? The welding and the L stock that holds the bottom. The the end, yeah. The end is all. Yep, we're going to cover that uh, because we're involved in a court case because of a weld. So uh, just so you know, 98% of all the fire escapes ever built in the United States are built with rivets and bolts. Every welded fire escape on the United States usually falls apart within its first 25 years. Well, it should be certified. Too. Well, I, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about what what do you do with a weld. So just so you know, every fire escape you're going to run across, welding is going to be the least uh, uh, violation you're going to find. But in some rare cases where they were repairing it and they just left the, weld, the rust in there and they did a Mickey Mouse job, welding was the repair without a fire permit and all these other things. So we're going to cover that today and what, what we, how do we guarantee a weld for you from now on? And, there's a, and there's, a, there's a cure for that so we don't have to load test it or x-ray it. So we're going to talk about that. And anybody else have any other horror stories or anything else that they're concerned that we think we can answer today? Is welding people? Yeah. Well, uh, well. It's legal if I have a brand new piece of steel today and I'm, and I'm welding it on a fire escape today and it's a brand new fire escape today and there's a fire permit today, right? I can weld all day long. Now, can I weld on a fire escape that's older than 1978 and the EPA has deemed it to have lead? The answer is no. So all these old fire escapes, welding is no longer acceptable because the EPA says you're going to get a $35,000 fine because the fire escape has lead and you can't take an open torch to, a fire, to anything that has lead, including a welding rod, which is basically an open torch. So that's the paint though, right? Yeah, because of the paint issue. And that's why when you, so we're gonna cover all three situations here. The inspection, and who's doing the right inspection. The repair, and who's doing the right repair with permits. And the painting, who's painting it with an EPA renovator's license, which is required by the law now. 
We're also going to talk about the coordination between building departments, housing inspectors, and fire inspectors. Nationwide, about 40 states, fire prevention handles it all. In 10 out of 40 states, building departments handle the inspections of fire escapes. And in some states, it's the, it's the maintenance uh, code or the maintenance, uh, what we guys call housing inspectors that pick that stuff up. So I'm not here to tell you who's, who's right, who's wrong. Uh, a well, little bit about uh, a little bit. all three agencies here today. Well, all three, of us this is yeah. all three actually issued a violation. Yeah. In uh, Jersey City. But I like the building, including the state. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the beauty. First of all, some of you asked about continuing ed credits. We've taught through Kane University at year. At this is actually a six-hour course, not today, but we've taught a six-hour course. I've taught at Sayreville, Bergen County, uh, uh, Camden. Okay, a six-hour continuing ed course. Right. And it got recorded, and we put it up online, but. Uh, this, today is just a class that was put on by Matt. Right. Uh, we actually do classes every third week of the month somewhere in the United States, and I told him about this class, and he hijacked the class and says, dude, yeah, you're going to have it over here at Jersey City, so that's why we're here. If we were going to do this at a hotel, he says, no, you're going to do it over here for, for the benefit of my people. Uh, Thanks, on. Matt. You're the best. He Thank said you. something about hotel. catered hotel. coffee, yeah. donuts, yeah. and, and fresh air. I don't know if that's after this, but uh, you guys can discuss that with him, okay? Because right now I'm just okay. here. I, it's one o'clock, so we're into brunch mode right now, anyway. So, <laughs> so the main thing that we're going to be talking about today, and this is the best. It's 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 back and forth. I'm here to show you that there's three codes. And they already support. We're not changing any codes. The codes are, you, there's been a misinterpretation of all the codes. You give me any code and I'll show you where it says you have a lot more power than you realized you, you had before. And there's three people that need to be controlled because they haven't been controlled. So if you can imagine fire escapes being painted, do I need a permit to paint a fire escape? So I will paint the fire escape till the day, I'm di uh, till the day I die and that's why there's no permits being pulled on fire escape repair because they're claiming there is no repairs, that we're just painting them. Now how can you just be painting a 75 year old structure? So well, that is gonna go away. That these certificates that just show up by a structural engineer, man, it's impossible that all they needed was a paint job. You change one bolt, do I need a permit? The answer is yes. You're touching it structurally, you need that. So believe me, you're gonna touch a lot more bolts than just one bolt. But this is where the perfect storm of stupidity has happened. You guys will write violations that say what? Scrape, prime, I mean scrape and paint your fire escape. Guess what happens when I get a call? I get a call from somebody said, hey, I got a violation from one of my inspectors. And it's, uh, I'll read the violation to you. It says, scrape and paint the fire escape. How much for you to paint the fire escape? Oh, well, ma'am, sir, uh, you have to have an inspected structure. No, 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 no. I just want you to give me a price to scrape and paint it. And the dangling tread, I had my Uncle Charlie take care of the dangling tread. Back up. I just want to price the script. As, as I try to educate them more and more, they hang the phone up on me. So guess who's been fixing fire escapes for the past 50 to 75 years? Has it been ornamental ironwork guys? Has it been welding guys? Has it been Joe Painter, right. who's part-time right. landscaper? Right. Or is it full-time landscaper, part-time painter? It doesn't matter. Those are the guys. And because of that, what are we getting? We're getting the gray-haired guys in the fire departments telling the guys with dark, shiny hair, in case of fire, don't use the. See? This is, this is what's told to everybody. So a lot of building department guys don't know this, a lot of uh, housing don't know that right now the fire department is the in, the, it's not on, doc, you can't find it on a document. You got that on a document somewhere that says in case of fire, never use the fire escape? You can't, the liability would be huge. But that's the N word. You're like, guys, these things are a piece of crap. Don't get on them. It'll end up killing you. And it does. So today's job is to show you that the building code, the fire code, the NFPA all say the same thing. So by going back and telling you that the code already says what you needed to say so you can write the right violation, the next thing you're going to talk about is how you're going to write the proper violation is that repair paint test. That's all you'll ever write on any violation you'll ever go to. You're right. Repair it, paint it, test it. All of a sudden now, these, pe these people are not going to go anywhere. And we've got documents in your, in your hands that are called uh, fire escape confidence test. It's a, like a final exam for a building inspector, I mean, uh, for a, uh, an engineer. We'll cover that too. So let's go on. Let's start with the, uh, 
Let's start right here first and make sure that everybody agrees with the codes, because you guys are all about codes. Let's start with the International Fire School. This is your 1028.6, correct? Fire Department, you write uh, testing and certification. Any fire escape system found to be in a state of deterioration or unsafe shall be repaired immediately. Is that a correct statement? Is that 1028.6? Perfect, then you immediately move into, depending upon structural condition, a load test shall be conducted. Who determines what depending on structural condition means? The engineer. See, right there, this is great. It's not the engineer. Depending upon the structural condition, a load test shall be conducted. Who determines that? You think an engineer is going to force his client into a load test, a very expensive three, five, ten thousand dollar load test? Oh, so this is what we're asking. Who decides if you've been satisfied on what this is called depending upon structural condition? So it's not engineers. He's just performing. The same way you guys get all talked about when it comes to sprinkler systems, alarm systems, change of use in a building, they all come and sit down with you and, and create a plan. Fire escapes are the same plan. This is the only second means of egress, not only for your tenants. Tenants use it to, vac uh, to evacuate, self-evacuate. They don't need your help. And you guys need to use this in case all hell breaks loose. Guess what you guys are going to use to get out of that building? So the low test shall be the, the, if the uh, authority having jurisdiction. Well, see, let's see if it says that anywhere else. The NFPA Life Safety Code, 1001.7. I taught two or three classes before I finally somebody gave me this code because I couldn't find it anywhere in the book. We don't use it. And here it is. Well, again, it's, sometimes it's referenced. Ready? The authority having jurisdiction shall be permitted to approve any existing fire escape system that has been shown by a load test or other satisfactory evidence of strength to have adequate strength. So who's the authority here? And what's the first thing they want before you even give them other adequate, uh, other satisfactory evidence? What's the NFPA go right for? Low test. But then they have this or, and the or is other satisfactory evidence, meaning somebody on the outside is gonna go beyond <clears throat> to prove to you that we don't wanna do a low test here, that the fire escape has, has a significant refurbishment to it to avoid the low test. Let's take a look at the International Building Code. Testing and certification. All exterior fire escape systems shall be examined or tested and or certified for structural adequacy every five years. Depending on the state, it's either every year or every five years. So does the building code, the International Building Code, support the International Fire Code? Does it have the same statement? Because they have examined and or tested. That means a load test. And But then they also say certified. What's the word certified mean? That's the other evidence of strength. So. Again, I told you, this is not a low test class. We're going to talk about low test. We're going to show you what low test is. Simpler than anybody can ever imagine. It's just putting weight on top of a platform. What can you use? Sand, water, bricks, lead bricks. You can put anything. I'll, get, I'll go over a low test criteria with you. It's mm -hmm. not that complicated. Question. Do we do it? No. 1028.6, though, that doesn't give you any more. It only gives you a low test. It yeah, it does. It says... The depending upon structural condition, a low test shall be conducted. Depending is your other evidence of strength. So, depending on the condition, who determines the condition of that fire escape? Well, we do. Yeah, because uh, an engineer came in and said, "Hey, it's good, man." I'm like, okay. Well, that doesn't give it an option of accepting another test in addition or. Yeah. Well, the way I read it, if, does anybody else read it? It says, "Depending on the condition, you make the final determination. You can order a low test, or you've been satisfied." So, the same thing, if I show you other evidence of strength, will you avoid the load test? Well, it says your code says you can. Otherwise, if you get some fly-by-night engineer that's not really taking this thing seriously, and they just threw a paint job on the fire escape, what can you order? And it's one of the best engineering firms in the country. You know, they spent, the guy spent $6,000 with that engineering firm. Yet you, you know, from the class that you've got today, you're like, I don't believe, that. I don't think this thing's done. I got, I got evidence of rust still in the connections. What can you order that the code says you can order, depending on the structural condition? You weren't satisfied, what do you order? You order a load test. So all these people throwing paint jobs on their fire escape, then bringing in the structural engineer? You say, dude, I want to see the load test. And you want to be there or not? You want to witness the, the collapse of the fire escape? Yeah, I like it. Okay, so now that we do, so we agree, 
the three codes, I'm going to repeat this code several times throughout. Do you agree that we're not changing any code that already exists? Both it's supported both by the fire code, the building code, and the NFPA all say a fire, uh, uh, the authority having jurisdiction, and in some states it's the building department, shall accept by load test or other evidence of strength. The other evidence of strength, believe it or not, is a full refurbishment. Now we were talking about this. A roof on a residential or commercial, does it change, does it get swapped out every 25 to 50 years on average? You change the roof out. Did it last 100 years, the roof? Roof shingles. <laughs> well, the point that I was trying to make is that these fire escapes have been out there for 50, 75, some 100 years, and they've not seen any bolt changes on them ever, other than a paint job. And that paint job came every 25 years when it was fully rusted and you, find, and you guys finally come in. I'm gonna show you and prove to you today on a case that we did for a fireman here in New York that all rust, all rusty fire escapes start at a connection and then eat the rest of the paint job on the surface. So if I, if I can prove to you today that all, you walk up to a rusty fire escape, that the initial fire escape rusted from the inside out, will you then have a, an opinion that all these connections are suspect? If I prove from a court case that all rust starts inside out, fire escapes don't rust from the outside in, they rust from the inside out. Point and drill. Say again? Point and drill. Right, so where you exposed and they never, they never cover. So we're going to cover that. So let's talk about a couple things that uh, really makes people worried. Now these are actual situations out there. But nice right now, Canada. firefighters are taking down the ladders and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children and mothers hanging off the side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them, they said, that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in the fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Well, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. Our firefighters say there's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson on the scene of Bridgeport, News 8. Now, the great thing about that uh, piece uh, that was, that's not, that's not even six months old, Bridgeport, uh, 50 families, right? Big complex and children trapped on a fire escape. People trapped on a fire escape. So was this a firefighter or a rescue mission? Rescue. It's a rescue. First thing you do, you get to any building. You got people, you get them first. Then you fight the fire second, right? So while they're getting all these people off the fire escape, fire escape, you can get off fire escapes yourself. Anybody see that eight-year-old child? Your daughter, that could be your granddaughter. She's jumping off a fire escape herself because the ladder wouldn't come down. And most of these ladders are 12 to 14 feet off the ground. Why wouldn't it come down? Probably rusted in place. Rusted in place, the weight balances are not working. But there's a fire. What's that? What's that little girl doing? She's saving her own life. <laughs> and so when the firemen got there, how did they get all these people off the fire escape? Using the ladders that were there, or bringing all the trucks, get all the ladders off the truck, get all these people off. The, my God, you know how much time? And this one, like the guy said at the end, we were lucky. You know, nobody died. If somebody died, there'd be a whole thing going on in Bridgeport. But nobody died. Going forward with this, we actually got called to inspect this fire escape six months after the accident. So we inspected all these fire escapes, and they're all, they all have life safety issues. It's been uh, three months since we've issued reports on it, and they're in the same condition. So a lot of times what happens is there's enforcement, no bite. And that's one of the things we'll talk about today is that well, there's got to be deadlines. Because you guys know when you, have, when you don't have 50% of your means of egress, what can you do to that building? Close it. Close it down. So things like that. Hey, let's talk about another. Anybody remember the Station Night Fire up in Rhode Island? A lot of people had to lose their, lose their lives. And what, right after that, we got a call from one of the investigative news reporters. She said, I'm going to do a piece on fire escapes. <coughs> and uh, tell people that in case of fire, you know, you can use your fire escape to get out. She says, oh, that's funny because 80% of the stuff I inspect doesn't pass inspection. 
out of that, 50 plus percent of those have emergency repairs if they're ready to collapse. You know, it's impossible. We got codes, we got laws, we got everything. So that one minute piece she wanted to do as a follow up to the station nine fire, talking about you know you have the ability to get out. She went on and did an investigation. What I did is I brought her down to the theater district and I gave her a 15 minute class. You guys are getting a three hour class. I gave her 15 minutes on what to look for. Big stuff like dangling treads, big huge bulges of rust, missing pieces, and unpainted fire escapes. That was the, the extent of the class. And then I said, she goes, okay, so show me some fire escapes. I said, no, just walk around. You tell me which one of these fire escapes pass. So she started walking around and uh, this is what she came up with. The smoke, the flames, and the frightened faces. All in a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night it wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Of course, scared to death. <laughs> but the fire escape that broke underneath him. Where the railing just came away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts more unsafe fire escapes. Rusty, deteriorating, crumbling broken and what state officials didn't know the system they set up to keep fire escape safe is also falling apart the potential ramifications are disastrous so let's look at this one this expert iron worker is licensed to build maintain and inspect fire escapes so then over here for months we examined dozens of them with alarming results looking at this today would this pass inspection no in dormitories at theaters at homes at apartment buildings rust is actually eating away the metal of the right. fire escape right and the bottom line it'll get weak and then eventually it'll fall this one has rotted connections this one missing bolts twisted metal would the stairs come down no never come down this one a broken tread so how dangerous is it for the people inside this building this fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody at a uh... In the cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked <coughs> building department files, but there's no fire escape certification. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. There's no certification in this one either. Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe or not? Well... I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, no. Four more fire escapes. Did it fall through the cracks? Yeah. Not one up to date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. Uh, How can they get away with that? Be, well, I guess that the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us on camera about this? No. But when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said it's a cold day in hell when that happens. In Cambridge, too, not one of our test buildings was certified, and the official in charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, where there are more than 8,000 fire escapes, again, according to inspectional services, not one we checked was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation when you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, It'll be too late to learn you've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Phillippe-Ryan. 
So, you can make that for any city in the United States. East Coast, West Coast, Chicago to Texas. It's the same situation. You take a quick look at this book, and I'll tell you what happened in Boston. <coughs> for them to change. This was in back in 72, and that's the back. So if you ever want to use that photograph to remind you of who Firescapes is, a, it's a double-edged sword. Firescapes can save lives or take them. And in this case, it actually took this woman. This one, a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. And um, the fireman survived. He grabbed the fire ladder with one hand as the rest of the fire escape fell away. Her niece landed on her, but she died. Okay? So fire escapes, are, which are made to save tenants or firemen, almost took everybody in this particular case here. So that's what everybody's worried about, the collapse of a fire escape. Well, how do you get that? How do you get that to be a guarantee that it's not going to occur? This is why firemen don't get on fire escapes. There needs to be a sort of a, some sort of national program. Now, it, this is how it's going to happen. Do you guys remember when sprinkler systems, 25, 35 years ago, you could have a building with, with or without a sprinkler system active, with or without an alarm system working correctly? It all depends where you left the envelope. That I mean, this is from the past, right? Today, can, is there any building that can stay active with a, with a dead sprinkler system? So, at, so the focus on it is huge because finally the awareness came along. Fire escapes is the same thing. We're not going to change this overnight. It's going to take three to five years. There's an awareness program. And one of the things we're, we're going to cover is imagine that over the next three to five years, all you wanted to do in your city was put a tag on the fire escape and gave it its status. It was either a status that when you got there, there was dangling treads, you put a red tag on it. If it was needs repair because it just looked rusty to you, you put a yellow tag on it. And if it was in pristine condition, it got a white tag got put on it by a private individual, which such as a structural engineer or a fire escape engineer, right? What would that do for firemen fighting fires in the middle of the night? Because they know the condition and shape. They know the immediate condition of the fire escape. What would that do for tenants in the building paying rent to the landlord? They could use it as a... They, I'm looking out my window and I got a red tag that's double-sided and I'm saying fire escape is out of service. Who am I going to call? If I get a yellow one that says Firescape has deficiencies, who am I going to call? Well, you already got the fire department. You guys are the ones that put it there. But if you put a red sticker on it, you almost have to back away. Well, that's a whole different story. We'll cover that. But let's say we're on a yellow, and I'm a tenant. I look out the thing, and I see a yellow sticker my on my rent. fire escape, and I'm, I'm not paying the. Pay my rent. There you go. I'm not going to pay my rent. That's it. It's either I'm not going to pay because of the cockroaches in the building, or my fire escape is out of service, yeah, yeah. or the other. I'm going to so, put an escrow until it's fixed. Exactly. So there's the, there's the pressure. And all you've done was put a tag on it, a conditional tag on it. So we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about everything we're going to cover today. Ready? What is fire escapes? What type of fire escapes there are? I'm going to cover today what's just called the Departmental Procedures and Guidelines. Matt, we gave you one of these, didn't we? Yes. For you guys to, to test drive and see. Repair, repair guidelines, so we're going to demystify the whole thing about what, how do you fix fire escapes or not. We're going to talk about how fire escapes are put together, and they haven't changed in 100 years. Okay? So that's all that we're going to cover today, quickly, because we only have so much time, I have to sort of go bullet train through this thing here, right? I'm going to show you what drawings look like. Is somebody supposed to draw something for you? We'll show you what drawings look like, so that way you know what to expect. We're going to show you also... A typical confidence test. We designed this confidence test for the city of Seattle and Tacoma. It's on their website. This is the national model for a confidence test. This is the, the exam for the engineer who has to write. When you read some of these questions, no longer can an engineer give you a, a disclaimer letter. It says, to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, the fire escape is structurally sound and has been kept painted today. What's that mean for tomorrow? Can you drag him to court? To the best of my information, knowledge, and belief today, the fire escape is structurally sound that has been kept painted. Can you drag me to court tomorrow? Yes. No. It's a disclaimer letter. It's an opinion letter. You asked me for my opinion today. I got paid 300 bucks. There's my opinion. If you want an opinion a month from now, call me, and I'll give you another $300 opinion. Otherwise, does the doctor say, you look good today. You should last at least five years? Or does he say, come back in five years and see me again? So the last thing we're going to talk about is what should be proper inspection procedures that include photographs. Everybody's got digital cameras. For them to start writing you reports without photographs, we're going to talk about the EPA and the lead law. 
and how you can't scrape or paint and weld on fire escapes anymore. We're going to talk about the classes and we're going to talk about credentials that people have to start giving you that are going to be fixing fire escapes in your area because guess what? If there's a million fire escapes in the entire United States, guess what we don't have enough of? Inspectors. Guess what you have plenty of? Repair guys. Who are the repair guys? Ornamental iron workshops. They'll repair these fire escapes. <coughs> welding guys, even though they're not going to light up their welding trucks, they have the tools they need to change all these bolts. So there's plenty of people to fix these fire escapes. Inspectors is all the structural engineers who need two to five thousand dollars to inspect your fire escape. So if you have a fire escape inspector, how much do they normally charge? A lot less. So there's not a lot of inspectors out there. Okay? That's why we started the, we just founded the National Firescape Association to basically create a place where you can go get knowledge, go get information, and in the future hopefully get certified as a firescape inspector or a um, firescape mechanic. But in the future, when you look out at there, there's only two licenses, and I'll cover that, in the United States that lets you touch firescapes today as an inspector. Boston has a G3 license, and California has a Reg 4 certification license to touch firescapes. Every other state didn't think there was going to be a need, okay? So now let's, uh, questions so far? Have, have anything that you guys have heard so far? No? Let's talk about live load tests where people did die. Ready? We've got this fire escape here where a woman fell five stories for, from her death because her boyfriend used to live, uh, live in this apartment. He would cross over the roof. They had a nice roof deck on the neighbors. And so him and his girlfriend would go there and drink at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. Except the phone rang. Somebody was calling. And she decided to get the phone. Maybe half tipsy, we don't know, but guess where she missed the uh, missing rail? See the missing rail right there? Guess where she went? Boom, boom, straight down there. Court case. Here's another case where people were selling a building. So we had the, the seller and the real estate agent, the buyer and the real estate agent, and one of the condo association guys on a fire escape that looks like um, that one over there, and the one I'm on is three of a kind, and they were on, the fire escape was right there. And as they're looking at the roof, because the guy who owned the building before he condo it, fixed, him and his son fixed the, the roof. Did he put all the bolts back? Everybody fell. Nobody died. <coughs> Grab your phone, dial. Who you dial? First dial is? Call your lawyer first. You have your lawyer call 911. Because everybody's in a lawsuit. Because they fell only 10 to 12 feet. All right? Now, this could have been a fireman just walking up there to check the situation. You'll never walk on a fire escape after this inspection. Not because I'm telling you not to walk on them. You don't need to. There's enough evidence from a fire escape that you can see from a door and from the ground. You can look up at a fire escape and you're going to be looking for evidence of maintenance. Otherwise, you see nothing but original hardware on a 50 to 75 year old structure and there's not one new hex head bolt. Do you need to get on that fire escape? You've got all the evidence you need to write a violation that says three words. Repair, paint, test. Can I eliminate the test word at the end? I can, when you come to me, I'll either test it or I'm going to, you give me other evidence of strength, what do I do to that word test? Can you not load test that fire escape? Can you give the order not to load test? Otherwise the code already says for you to, it's an automatic. I want you to repair it, which involves getting an inspector. I want you to paint it, which requires the maintenance code, and then I want you to test it. Because if you spot repair a fire escape, what always comes after a spot repair? I change 10 bolts and I leave behind 50 to 75 year old squares and rivets. You want an opinion letter from me after I finish out filling out my confidence test? You want an opinion? Or you want a, you want a guarantee? So if I spot repair any fire escape anywhere, a couple of welds here, which you know I illegally did it without my fire permit and the EPA never caught me. I changed a couple of tread bolts and I left everything else original. So spot repair means what to you? Always. On every fire escape you run across. <coughs> load test. They said, please, I don't want to load test. That's three thousand, five thousand, eight thousand, twelve thousand dollars more. What can you tell them? Do a full refurb. You should do the you should do the full refurb, which by the way, you should have had this done twenty five to fifty years ago anyway, and you avoid the load test. What's the average load cycle? For after a fire escape gets refurbished, fully refurbished, and there's no load test this year, five years from now, how long before I have to load test that fire escape after I had a full refurb this year? What's the average industry standard cycle? 25 years. 
So for 25 years, every time I inspect five years from now, which I still have to inspect every five, I come back to you, I keep providing you other evidence of strain. Say, hey, the thing's been kept painted, all the connections are sealed with silicone, all the tie backs into the building are still looking good, and by the way, five years ago, dude, we refurbished this whole thing. Here's the photograph. Like, oh, no low test. Fine. So the average fire escape out there gets their bolts rechanged every 25 years, or to, depending where they live, you know, near the ocean or not, whatever. So for 20 to 25 years, low test is not even going to be a concern. So what's better for a client? Low test today, and then five years from now, low test again, and five years from then, low test again, or refurb today. But you're going to get some people that are going to have a pristine fire escape, 10-story pristine fire escape, all the bolts are tight, square head bolts are good, rivets are good, and they got a few minor things, readjust the cantilever, and that's it. What's the only answer for them? Low test. Five years from now, what's the only answer? Low test. So low test every now and then will come into play when somebody has only a few minor repairs, whether or not the client at that time says, you know, what's my spot repair and my low test? I'm just using numbers right now. Oh, but your spot repair and low test is gonna cost you 15 grand. What's my total refurb and avoid the low test for the next 25 years, 20 grand. Some clients will look at that and say, you know what? I'm gonna bite the bullet this year and, and just get the full refurb on this simply because I'm gonna get every connection cleaned out all my bolts are going to change out. I'm going to get them silicone and sealed anyway with 50 year silicone. I'm going to get new tie backs into the building and I'm not going to have to deal with a load test, which this year was going to cost me eight grand as an example. Five years from now, it's going to cost me 10 grand, 12 grand. So some people will start doing the, you know, the whole seesaw thing and as to what. You'll never decide what they're going to do. Can you ever tell them to spot and load test or full refurb? Can you ever force them into one, one of those? No, they pick. Can they do anything but that? When you write a violation, can they do anything but spot repair it and load test it or refurbish it, no load test? Can they do anything else? That's not, that's not what the law says. So, I was in Iowa, I'm involved in a case in Iowa. Three kids, two guys and a girl were watching fireworks. The fire escape was put back by the maintenance guys who forgot to put in the through bolt. Instead of putting in the through bolt, they put in that lag screw back in the hole. They all fell to the ground, boom, boom, blood on the ground, crippled. <laughs> This looks like the leg of the staircase. back and they put the, they were so in, un, insecure of themselves they even put a leg on it and a leg right into the asphalt shingle, no no base to it, you know. And down at the corner where there was a hole holding it because it wrapped the corner, there was a hole there, we were able to go back there and lift it and walk it back out again because they didn't even reattach it back down here. And this whole thing fell to the ground and they carted it off to a field eight, eight blocks away and then they just put it back and so court cases, everybody keeps getting sued. Live load testing. Several examples of live load testing, right? You guys remember this in the old days when air conditioning, uh, remember? Uh, now this is very popular. Oh, it's a parade? Let's put as many people as we can on these rotten fire escapes, right? Um, this is your situation. You guys get this all the time. People say, hey, in case of fire, never use a fire escape. Hell no, man. When all hell breaks loose, guess what you guys jump on? You have no choice. Uh, emergency situations happens all the time. You know what I'm saying? Are you guys able to see? All right. Um, and uh, believe it or not, even in our field, this is actually not the picture of one of my uh, guys that I work with out of Chicago. His dad fell seven stories doing exactly this. That's not his dad, but that's seven stories. You know, oh, fix, fix, boom, seven stories down. So it gets everybody. These are like little hand grenades. Another live load testing, you know, not too many parties in some of these buildings, is there? Interaction between buildings, a lot of the uh, fraternities or the uh, the housing for colleges, they don't do this, do they? Summertime cookouts. Summertime cookouts, they don't do that, right? How about that one over there? How about people now are making it, you know, common to take a picture on a fire escape with a wedding? Imagine, hey, my wife, <laughs> gotta get a new wife, I don't know. And college students who are not allowed to smoke inside the building, where do they smoke? 
fire escapes. So that's all live load testing, right? And uh, let's talk about who inspects in, uh, in the country. All the codes allow structural engineers to inspect the fire escape. The next one is they sometimes allow civil engineers. The next one is they allow architects in some states to inspect. A lot of them think city officials inspect. They say, oh, the city officials have been here every year and they've never said anything. Why are you picking on my fire escape? Because they write violations they don't inspect. They write violations. Well, oh, oh, no, you're crazy. Get the hell out of here. And, you know, we get this all the time. And fire escape inspectors. Two licenses, Boston license, California license. I have both. Okay? One's building department issued once, but there's no national fire escape inspector's license. That's why we started the National Fire Escape Association, not only to house all this knowledge that we have out there, but also to start some standardization to say people can go basically test, become a, a certified fire escape mechanic and a certified fire escape inspector. Let's take a look at this. Let's talk about opinions versus load tests. This is actually in Fort Lee. This is, uh, a lot of people don't realize, but in the 1900s, during the, during the talkies and during the uh, silent movie era, the Hollywood was... Fort Lee. One of the biggest places for a lot of the a lot of the movies was in this in this property that I'm at. The reason I got called to this property to inspect it is because they had an engineer stamp, not an engineer stamp, they had an engineer report that the secretary got, not you guys. And she goes, Man, I don't know what this guy's doing. He's telling me to give it a paint job and fix a tread. But I think there's bigger problems. This is a secretary concerned about. And this building now is used as storage only. So we went there and looked at the fire escape, but just as your opinion, pass or fail the fire escape? You think it has any structural issues? Okay, so we got a report that came, because we said, sure, I'll go, I'll go by and take a look, that's me inspecting the building, and thank God it was a white one. White one, is, I actually took all my photographs high res, because we use this as a, as a case study. Whenever you get this much rust built up somewhere, you can use it. Um, this is the letter that we got from the structural engineer. And it's hard to read, but it basically says there's a few things he wants you to do. He wants you to fix the broken tread. Bent, there's a bent piece of flat somewhere on one of the platforms. Give it a good scraping and a painting, and he'll come back and sign off on it. And there's a, this, this is the disclaimer that, you know, this wasn't a critical examination. This was just a, a cursory visual over, overview. So what was going to happen? What, this is how big the thing is. We condemned it that day. This is my inspection. Look at all the photographs that I shot. And then when I did hammer testing, all kinds of things. So, is this really a contest about who's better? Am I better than this guy? Or is it that there's, since there's no standard of inspection, you can basically do whatever you want to do? <coughs> and, since, and since this was a paint job, how do you think this fire escape was going to get fixed? With a permit or no permit? Yeah. Right? Because the guy said one tread, one flat thing. You're not going to pull a permit for that. Right? So 75 years, guys, this has been happening. You get caught at a fire escape working on it, and somebody comes in, I don't care what official shows up, you know what you tell them? Just paint it. We're just paint it. Because, <coughs> and if they're really good, I've got this violation from Mary Gray. From Mary, she says right here, scrape and paint, she didn't say structural. So we're scraping and painting it. I didn't know you needed to get a permit. You better talk with Mary, because she doesn't know what she's doing. So they've been getting 75 years nationwide. This is what they've been doing. All because Fire Prevention and Building Department wrote in their violation, scrape and paint your fire escape. Does anywhere there say, go get an inspection first, and then scrape and paint it? Go get it professionally evaluated, then scrape and paint it? Do you see the flaw? <laughs> the little hole that everybody was hiding in? You guys are getting fire escapes that are 50 to 75 years old. The only thing they've been is probably got, they've gotten two, three paint jobs in their lifetimes. They get painted every 20 to 25 years. And only when you get caught. Nobody does preventive maintenance. <coughs> so, so this one was for me, right? I was in Chicago just recently, so this is a, a recent update, right? And the guy, I was like, oh, you have an engineer, and this engineer says, scrape and paint it. Fix a couple things, scrape and paint it. On this complex that has 150 apartments. And these 150 apartments are all serviced with these kind of things. The uniqueness about this is that there's a there's a bracket. It's reverse bracketed. So from the wall comes this bracket that comes down and grabs the, the corners, you know, the front ends, right? And I said, well, 
I'll give you a bid on it, but let me walk the thing first and just get a general idea, because then I'll speak with your engineer and I'll say, hey, I found some other things or not, and agree or disagree with this. I walked the fire escape and I found these things. You know those broads that come down? That's them right there. Are those passable? Every one of the fire escapes, the rods are all equal. So I photographed them. They, uh, I kind of disagree with your engineer. It's like, did he even walk these things? Treasure full of rust. Major rust everywhere. I says, oh, no, no, very good. It's a professional firm there. I don't care how professional they are. I'm not going to paint this thing. I'm worried about my men even getting on it. That was 150 apartment units. And all six fire escapes were, I condemned them. So you do your thing, you make your phone calls, and until this day they haven't done anything with it yet. So again, because there's no standard of inspection, <coughs> what happens? Everybody's kind of relying and waiting for something to happen because nobody knows what the guidelines are. The guidelines are prepare, paint, test. As soon as you write a violation and somebody says, I got a violation from you, and it says repair, paint, test. You think they're going to ask you what the word repair means? Repair what? Right? Repair what? Because they're waiting for you to tell them that one tread and that one bolt. They'll fix that one tread and that one bolt. So when they say, well, fix what? Well, what am I going to repair? says, I, I'm not going to tell you what to repair. I need you to have it professionally evaluated. Isn't that what's going to happen? Because they're going to call you because you wrote a violation. What's repair mean? What do you say? I don't know. That's why you need to have it professionally evaluated. A report will be generated that I will been, then receive, and me and your engineer are going to go over a game plan for you of what we're going to do about this fire escape. But I don't know what to repair, but I know that it's in disrepair. There's so much surface rust on this thing. I know that you got structural problems. Please have your professional evaluator, your engineer of record, give me a report. Tell me what's wrong with this thing. Okay, what's the word paint? Paint means that you've got an old fire escape here and EPA says you can't just go out there and scrape it and, and blow uh, the dust chips everywhere. They have to have an EPA renovator license, person that's going to collect all your chips and make sure that when you scrape and paint that fire escape, they're doing that as per EPA guidelines. <coughs> and anybody nowadays will take that $175 class on a weekend, eight hours later, you have half, a half intelligence, you'll walk out of there with a certificate. It just tells you how to handle and, and collect you know, leaded paint chips and do it legally without getting fined. What about the repair guy? Well, your repair guy can't do a damn thing until the engineer of record has come to me with a game plan as to whether we're going to spot repair it and load test it, or we're going to refurbish it to avoid the load test, and then you, he needs to take that report and go apply for a permit at Inspectional Services. Because Inspectional Services is no longer taking, yeah, I'm going to go repair a fire escape. Okay, what are you going to do? I'm going to repair it. Where's your report? of what you're going to do. So then the report that you have authorized from the engineer of record is now attached to the permit application at the building department and says, I'm being watched by Joe Engineering, and here's the report, and here's my permit, and then they proceed with the repairs on the permit. Now eyeballs are watching, so does that landscaper, painter, ornamental guy now going to have workers' comp and liability? If he doesn't, can he do this? So only professional guys can start doing this repairs, and that is the, we already have them there, they're already, they're ready to work, their shops are idle right now, which is ornamental line work guys, how many in Jersey City? A few, right? How many welding guys with the welding machine on the back of the truck, which sadly they're not gonna use, but they have all the other tools necessary to fix the fire escape. How many welding guys running around the city? So we have an army ready to fix these? Right? Now, we even have an army of inspectors. How many structural engineers will inspect this correctly if we give them that confidence test to fill out at the end and at the beginning that has all those questions? Structural engineers, they know what they're doing. So they just got to be given a standard of some kind, okay? We got rust. This is the detention center for juveniles, 17 and younger. It's okay. One just needs paint. <laughs> so when you first walk up to a, a rusty fire escape, by the time you get surface rust on a fire escape, every piece of that rust came from an internal connection. Okay? So now, this is what you look like when you stick your nose underneath that very same stairs. Okay? This is what rust looks like when it starts building. In our case that we did for the, for the firemen, 
A quarter inch of rust takes 25 years of unchecked growth <coughs> to grow a quarter inch. When you got fit, when you got a half an inch, that's almost 50 years of unchecked growth. Now that's proven in a court case by a metallurgist who will take the weather patterns for the past 50 years and he'll tell you how long it took that rust to grow. And that's what we have to do in that case. So, but the rule of thumb is a quarter inch takes 25 years of, of unchecked growth. Nobody, no paint on it. So, when I tell you guys, when you start looking for a Farscape inspection, you're going to be looking for original hardware. And if you see it, it's 50 to 75 years old, is it suspect? You got rust in the connection, is that suspect? You're down on the ground looking up, you see no evidence of maintenance, no new hex head bolts, nothing but rivets and square heads. Do you want to get on it? You get on it, this is what occurs.